Welcome back, folks. Today, we shall be attempting an exam-style objective test question. Let's not waste any time and get straight into it. It's currently the 1st of December 20x8, and you are the audit senior in charge of the Audit of Piano Co. for the year ending 31st December 20x8. So, we are in the planning phase of the audit, which is when we look at audit risks. You are currently in the planning stage of the audit, and the audit manager has held a planning meeting with the client. They have also provided you with the following notes and financial statement extracts. This year, the economy has affected Piano Co. significantly, resulting in reduced sales prices. Consequently, yearly revenue has been reduced. To manage profits, Piano Co. has switched to a supplier that produces cheaper but inferior quality goods. This decision has resulted in an increase in sales returns from customers. From this whole sentence, we can already expect the financial statements to show a revenue reduction. The main thing we should be worrying about are the returns, which usually require a provision to be recognized. During the year, the directors performed a review of asset lives, which increased the useful life of the majority of non-current assets. Accordingly, the depreciation charge has been reduced from $1.5 million in 20 x 7 to $1.3 million in 20 x 8 Hmm. Now, every time you see this happening, always question the director's motives. The company is not doing well, so there is an incentive to ensure that profits are cushioned. As such, the company might want to adjust profits by adjusting areas involving judgment like depreciation. Remember what we learned in the chapter on fraud. Here are the financial statements extracts for the year ending 31st December. Let's take a look at what the financial statements are telling us. So, revenue has been reduced as expected. Profits have also been significantly reduced. The inventory balances are getting bigger and so are the receivables. Cash has reduced significantly and trade payables have increased by a margin. Let's go to the first question. Using the financial statements provided, calculate the following ratios for both years. Calculate your answer to one decimal place and enter the answer in the relevant box. This is easy. Let's start with the gross profit margin. Now, you remember the formula, right? Gross profit divided by sales multiplied by 100%. For 20x8, it would be 7.5 divided by 16.5 multiplied by 100% giving you 45.5%. For 20x7, it will be 10 divided by 20, giving you 50%. And just like that, we have our first mark. The second ratio to compute is the current ratio, which is calculated as current assets divided by current liabilities. Now, I know what you're thinking. We don't have the entire balance sheet to do this calculation. Relax. If you look carefully, you'll realize that we have enough elements here to derive the current assets and liabilities. For current assets, we can derive this by the sum of the inventory, receivables, and cash balances. For current liabilities, we just need to add payables and the overdraft balance. For 20x8, current assets would be 3.1 plus 4 plus 1, which gives you 8.1. The current liabilities would be 2.5 plus 1, which is 3.5. This information gives us a current ratio of 2.3. For 20x7, current assets would be 2.6 plus 2 plus 2, which is 6.6. .6. Current liabilities would be 1.6 plus 1, which is 2.6. This would give us a current ratio of 2.5. Next question then. In relation to the movement in the payables payment period, which of the following statements is most relevant to the auditor's consideration of audit risk? Okay, so before you even look at the potential answers, note that since the question refers to the payable payment period, we should calculate that first. And I'm sure you remember the formula, right? Yep, correct. Payables over cost of sales multiplied by 365. For 20x8, this would be 2.5 divided by 9 multiplied by 365, which gives you 101 days. For 20x7, this would be 1.6 divided by 10 multiplied by 365, which gives you 58 days. So, the trade payables payment period has risen significantly. We need to consider which statement is related to audit risks. As we have learned before, when the payables period goes up, 
there is a potential overstatement of payables and an understatement of the cost of goods sold. Let's now take a look at the statements. The payables payment period has decreased, which could indicate an understatement of payables. This is completely incorrect. The payables period has increased, not decreased, so wrong. The payable payment period has decreased, which could indicate that Piano Co. is taking advantage of early payment discounts. Wrong again. Next. The payables payment period has increased, which could indicate that Piano Co. has cash flow problems. So, we can see a huge drastic increase here. The cash balance has also been reduced, which may indicate difficulties in paying vendors. This could indicate potential cash flow issues, hence going concern. This fact could potentially impact audit risk, so this option is valid. The payables payment period has increased, which could indicate Piano Co. is managing its working capital cycle by delaying payments to suppliers. So, this is the counter-argument to option 3, which needs to be investigated further in assessing going concerns, as we have just discussed earlier. As such, this is not part of the audit risk consideration, but something we shall investigate later. So, the answer is option 3. Next question. Which three of the following describe audit risks that should be addressed during the audit of Piano Co.? Let's go through each of these statements to see if they are consistent with our understanding thus far. We also need to determine which statements are audit risks and not business risks. Inventory may be overstated if sales prices have fallen below cost. Why is inventory overstated when sales prices are lower than cost? Remember, inventory is valued at the lower of cost or net realizable value, which is a function of the sales price. Now, we know that the sales price was reduced, so this could be true. Provision for the return of goods may be understated. Yes, we spoke about this earlier. There are a lot of returns, so there might not be sufficient provisions. The economy has affected Piano Co., causing its revenue to fall. Well, this is a statement from the scenario. It does not tell us which financial statement item is affected. As such, this is not an audit risk. Sales prices have been reduced, which will impact profitability. Again, this is a business risk, as it has no financial statement implications. Lower quality goods have been purchased, resulting in complaints from the customers. Again, this is a business risk, not an audit risk. Inventory may be misstated if returned goods have not been recorded back into inventory. Yes, if the returned goods are not included in the inventory, it could be understated. So, options 1, 2, and 6 are correct. Which two of the following describe appropriate auditor responses to the audit risks related to the increase in the useful life of Piano Co.'s tangible non-current assets? Okay, we will be learning more about fixed asset audits in a later class, but for now, the key thing you have to know is this. When there is a change in asset useful lives, the key questions are why was it done and was it done properly? To answer the first question, we need to establish the reasons for the change with the directors and see if the reasons given are reasonable. To answer the second question, we can test whether the changes were done properly by looking at the trends in asset usage, i.e. how often they are disposed of, and so on. Now, let's look at the statements. Calculate whether the change in depreciation charge is material. If not material, no further action is necessary. Whether it's material or not, it doesn't matter. We still need to establish the reason for the change to assess if the reason is valid. Discuss the reason for the change in the useful life with the directors. Bingo! Compare the actual useful life of tangible non-current assets recently disposed of to the new depreciation policy to assess whether this reflects the actual useful economic life. Bingo again! Compare the fixtures and fittings depreciation rate this year to last year. Well, this will be a waste of time as we already know that the rate has been changed. So the answer is options 2 and 3. Last one, which of the following correctly describes the term performance materiality? This is easy. Remember that performance materiality is an amount below materiality. When we aggregate misstatements, it would not surpass materiality. Let's look at the options. An amount which, through its omission or misstatement, 
would affect the economic decisions of the users taken on the basis of the financial statements. This is the definition of materiality, but not performance materiality. The maximum amount of misstatement the auditor is willing to accept and still conclude that the financial statements are fairly stated. This is what the auditor can tolerate, also known as the tolerable misstatements, an amount which reduces the probability that the aggregate of uncorrected and undetected misstatements exceeds materiality for the financial statements as a whole. Yep, this is the closest thing to what we had in mind. An amount below which misstatements of balances and classes of transactions in the financial statements would be clearly trivial. This statement describes trivial or non-material items. So, the answer is option 3. Please attempt these questions again from time to time as it will help you make your understanding of this topic a lot more concrete. Well, that's it. We're done. Take care, folks, and see you in our next session.